Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's work session. <laughs> Good evening, Mr. Patchell. All right, uh, first off, we'll start with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, I'd like to announce that um, the board met in executive session this e evening from 7 o'clock to 7.25 p.m. to discuss matters of personnel. Moving on then to the audience of citizens. This meeting is being videotaped for community cable channels. Individuals attending this meeting and intending to speak to the board should be aware that they are being videotaped. In order to meet the requirements of Pennsylvania's Sunshine Law, it is necessary to record the names of all citizens who speak to the board during the meeting. To assure compliance with this requirement, it is essential that those planning to address the board come to the microphone, state their name and address, and sign the audience of citizens logbook. Members of the audience are asked to limit their questions and comments. To allow time for those who wish to speak to the board, the board president may ask an individual to yield the microphone to the next speaker. And Mr. Patchell, you are aware of our three minute timer, so I don't have to read the whole thing, right? Yes, go ahead. Oh, oh. Well, should I speak? You, you can speak now, yep. Oh, okay. Go ahead. I didn't know what the... Uh, what well, you know that when it turns yellow, you have 30 yeah, seconds so left, right? Put, now, uh, before we start the three, hun, <laughs> 180 <laughs> seconds, uh, I, I had, before I started, I put a uh, body mass indicator, which I gave to Dr. Dietrich, and you can look at this later on. And this is, uh, this is germane to the uh, full day kindergarten because I was actually shocked that the number of obese children, uh, I go to bridal path. I don't know whether it's improved or anything, not, but as you know, there's a, uh, there's a current problem throughout the country and throughout the industrialized world, uh, that obesity is really becoming a problem. So when you institute full day kindergarten, and I got this information so that it might illuminate you, that what we are looking for is a full, full development of the entire individual. You know, we're preoccupied with academics, but at a very early age, like that young man that was here, he, uh, he was very correct in some of those things that he was pointing about the water and uh, changing our lifestyle. And uh, as I said, that that if, if we could all turn out students at his caliber, I tell you what, they'd be coming from all over the world. They think they'd be coming to, to you know, Penn. OK, so that that's what I said. And you can look this over at your leisure. I talked to some board. Me oh, I'm William Patrick. I live at 404 Bonnie Lane in uh, Lansdale, it's actually Montgomery Township. And I'll make this, okay, three minutes. Okay, <laughs> there's so many people waiting to talk. <laughs> okay, during this past week, I spoke to some of the board members concerning the implementation of full day kindergarten. This is a very, very good issue. It needs a lot of dialogue. And I think implementation is gonna be more difficult because of the the hastened schedule that we're putting ourselves on. Uh, uh, as you know, the enrollment has declined. I got this information. Since 2013 to the present, we're standing at about 804, but I looked at that trend line. It, it has gone down. I believe it's like 40 or 50 less students than we had 2000, 2013. And I said, there's over, overlying things that are going on now. Mortgages just hit 5% today. And I'll tell you what, if you want to buy one of these townhouses and with these taxes and all these other things that are going on, you know what? We're not going to have a real good diversity here. Yay. You need to make about $200,000 a year to live in North Penn School District, unless you want to live in Hatfield or, you know, some of the disadvantaged areas. Firstly, how many parents would still like to have half-day kindergarten. It's hard to believe, you know, some parents, no, my wife doesn't work, she stays home with the children. She wants to stay home. This, not, this is not, you know, some kind of socialistic things, everybody gotta come here. No, the state doesn't even mandate kindergarten. You can stay out if you want. Some people enjoy their children. I see when they get to be teenagers, they go out to eat, nobody talks, they sit like this. Mr. Patchell? Yep. I think your time is up. 
Oh, okay. Sorry. So I think we need to look at the implementation and thank for those people that did speak to me on their free time. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Moving on to new business. The comprehensive plan presentation will be presented by Dr. Rufo tonight. Okay. Good evening, everyone. So the comprehensive plan, as you know, is quite a lengthy document. It's nearly 200 pages in length. So tonight we've condensed that down. We'll be giving you the highlight reel. And if there are things or questions that you have that you would like me to elaborate on, please just go ahead and interject or ask questions as we move along. Okay, so first off, what is the comprehensive plan? Uh, it is a district level plan that we are required to have by the Pennsylvania Department of Education, which contains our vision, mission, our shared values, and then action plans for continuous improvement in our district. And it really provides the overarching direction and goals, and it is for the years 2019 through 2022. So this plan is due at the end of November. We need to submit it to the state. So we're bringing it here first, and then we will post it for public comment for 30 days. That'll give us enough time to get it in by the deadline. So what are the major changes? The major things that you'll see that are different in this plan from prior years is that there's a greater focus on diversity and how we can meet the needs of diverse learners. There is more of a holistic focus on students. So while academics are obviously our key mission and key goal, we can't neglect the other needs of students. So social emotional learning, behavioral, mental health, really looking at students from a wider lens. Um, and we're also looking at multiple approaches to data beyond just student achievement data. So how we can gain some more perceptual input and feedback and other information that we can gain from our stakeholders. So for our mis vision, mission, and shared values, uh, the vision as it's described in the plan is something that provides a direction for the future of the organization if we are successful in our mission. So previously, what we had in the plan, um, you can see there, it was student-centered with a focus on academic challenge, meaningful experiences, and personal responsibility, um, which as a group, we thought that we really needed to tighten that up and expand it some more. So uh, the vision that we have developed moving forward um, is more comprehensive. North Penn School District seeks to develop students who embody its universal values of achievement, kindness, collaboration, respect, responsibility, resilience, and integrity. Through an education that develops students both academically and emotionally, equitable opportunities, and a respect for human differences, members of the North Penn community will contribute meaningfully to their local and global communities. And the respect, responsibility, and resilience piece, uh, that was a lot of feedback from our staff. We had, over the past several years, Dr. Dietrich held what he called conversations with Kurt, where we really developed what those core values were. So that was another, another change that you would see from the prior plan. So the mission, what's the purpose of our organization? The bullets that are there are all, aside from the last one that's highlighted, were ones that were in the previous plan. Um, so we felt that those were still important to continue on with. Um, but we also additionally added develop a respect for diversity and appreciation of human differences. We thought that it was important to call that out in our mission. and our shared values again the first five that are up there were in the previous plan and we also added strength and diversity to link back to the mission and the goals any questions with vision mission or values before we move on okay, okay so strength and diversity since that is a new uh, shared value what we defined it as was recognizing the power in respecting, understanding, and celebrating human differences to build community, inspire ideas, develop shared experiences, and enrich the organization. So we really felt as a whole that adding that in um, better speaks to our mission and to the community that we serve. So going into the, the meat of the plan, the first part is really looking at what our accomplishments and concerns are. So for our district accomplishments, um, we summarized it really to this list here. Um, first of all, our participation and performance on AP exams. So last year, we had over 1,500 AP exams that were administered, and 85% of those exams, students scored a score of three or higher, um, which is typically eligible for college credit. Um, our key keystone scores remain some of the highest in the state. And while we did see a slight dip in our PSSA scores due to revised assessment, um, our PSSA scores continue to be above the state average. 
our inclusive education and focus on inclusive practices has resulted in growth for our students with IEPs from their previous achievement. Uh, our professional learning opportunities. So we offer a variety of professional development for teachers through different in-services, workshops, job embedded coaching. Um, we've been exploring more online platforms. We felt that that was important to mention as a strength. Our network infrastructure, we have implemented the one-to-one -one Chromebook initiative, increased our bandwidth, and the full implementation of G Suite or Google Suite with our staff has resulted in a more reliable network. Uh, our energy and safety improvements, also we saw as accomplishments, we've established CERT teams, the crisis emergency response teams in each of the buildings. Um, we've also enhanced some of the uh, physical aspects of the building with increased um, security and features that m make our buildings more safe for our students. Uh, and then finally, we wanted to highlight our induction, induction and mentoring program, um, which we feel is very strong. We always get good feedback from our new teachers. There's a solid foundation in place for them so that they're well supported when they come into the district and we have opportunities for them throughout the year. Any questions? So our concerns, as I mentioned earlier, we did see a decrease in our PSSA scores for ELA and math. Um, so while there was a revision in the test, that's never something that we want to see, so definitely something that we're looking to improve. Uh, we are looking for greater growth scores for our students. So while our students are growing, um, we wanna see our students that are at the lowest levels grow even more so that we can decrease the achievement gaps between students. Uh, for student behavior, we have not previously had a consistent framework uh, for dealing with student behavior and student mental health needs. And while we have increased our technology and our access, we really want to look at how we can shift instructional practices so that technology is used to enhance um, and redefine our education rather than as a substitute for paper and pencil. So looking to shift how we're using technology instructionally. Um, and although we completed a 10-year enrollment projection study, there is a need for that to inform our facilities and long-range plan. Uh, again, we're looking to close the achievement gaps and then our behavior gaps specifically before our grade one. Um, so we have seen when we're talking about some increases in behavior and mental health concerns, we have seen that particularly in our youngest students, so that is a concern. Uh, and then finally, a need to review and revise our district policies and procedures so that we're looking at things comprehensively and systematically over time rather than as they just come up with changes in the law. Okay, so really what our goals center around are those concerns that we've just identified. So I'll walk you through each goal and there are action steps that are accompanied with each goal. So our first goal is improving student achievement, both growth and mastery. So by growth, we mean um, we might not always have students that achieve at proficient or advanced, but we want to at least see them moving among levels. So if they're in below basic, we want to move them to basic, then basic to proficient, proficient to advanced, and then finally pushing our advanced students so we're not losing them. Um, so looking at our instructional practices that address our student needs for core instruction, so the instruction that everyone is getting, and then our enrichment for advanced learners and our intervention. Okay, so how are we going to do that? Obviously, full day kindergarten is a major strategy for us. So this year we'll be spending a lot of time revising the kindergarten curricula to look at a full day schedule. So um, we'll be addressing not just academics, but also social emotional learning, behavioral, having time for purposeful play, structured times throughout the day for movement. Um, in terms of curriculum, uh, we will be looking at a revised social studies curriculum in elementary. That curriculum cycle is in review this year uh, and mathematics down the road. Um, probably next year we'll be looking at that, as well as developing a district-wide mathematics instructional model. Um, and all that falls under that second bullet there, the instructional strategies aligned with the PA core. Um, we'll also be taking a look at our elementary assessments to determine um, what are the best assessments that we're using and what are, their, what are their uses for? Are we getting our bang for our buck with those assessments? So um, really taking a critical look at how are we using that data and trying to streamline it so that we're not over assessing and we're getting the most that we can out of those assessments. Uh, transformational digital learning practices. We are using Linkit, the new online platform, to um, develop and house our data and also down the road hopefully to administer some online assessments. Um, we're piloting that in a number of areas this year. And we're also educating our stakeholders on personalized learning and using digital te technology to do that. So how can we use technology so that we're really customizing things for each student? 
Uh, another goal of ours is to align our three middle schools better, both operationally and instructionally, so that we have similar middle, middle school experiences across the district. And then finally, recommendations to our professional development program. So really evaluating where we're at now, what's working, what could we improve upon, um, and how can we get some more professional development that's ongoing so that we're not just waiting for our in-service days and we're really weaving our PD throughout the year. Any questions on our first goal? Sure. Curious. I'm not as familiar with the term behavior gap as I am achievement gap. So I'm wondering, what are the data points that you're using to measure what the gap is and how to narrow it? That's a great question. And we do have um, one of the goals that's focusing specifically on that. And that's the problem, is that we don't have a consistent framework right now. So we're really, while we have perceptual data or discipline data, there's not really one centralized way that we're measuring that and looking at that. Um, obviously, what we're hearing from our teachers, mm -hmm. what we're seeing as administrators, but we're looking, moving forward, implementing school-wide positive behavior supports so that we can really collect some of that in a more systematic way. Okay. Okay, okay so goal two uh, is to develop district, pr district practices supporting an inclusive, culturally responsive environment that guarantees equity and access to all students and their families. Now, next month, we will be presenting our cultural proficiency plan to ECP, so you'll be hearing more about that next month. Um, for purposes of this plan, we are talking about racial, ethnic, and cultural diversity, but also um, diversity in terms of student ability with our students with IEPs, uh, in language, students with ESL, um, and our students who may be LGBT. So um, this plan really has that umbrella, and then we'll be going into greater detail on the cultural, racial, and ethnic diversity, specifically with the cultural proficiency plan. So some of the strategies is we're looking at using culturally responsive instruction and professional development. And our theme for this year, which I imagine will be continue to carry us through, is really knowing our students. So what are their backgrounds and their cultures and how that affects their brain and their learning. And we're also pulling in some brain research into that. Um, we're looking at increasing the proficiency of staff in culturally responsive teaching practices, taking some baseline data this year and then measuring that over the next three years, and also implementing cultural proficiency professional development modules. Uh, as the board is aware, our goal is also to implement practices that promote an increased pool of diverse applicants for positions across all employee groups. So how can we recruit diverse staff, but then also maintain those staff? We're looking to increase our student and family engagement in our cultural proficiency efforts. Uh, so we will be starting with taking some baseline data this year, as well as hosting some events that will begin that dialogue. Uh, moving into more of the ability lens, we want to look at reducing the number of students who are disproportionately identified for special education. So students from certain groups, either racial, ethnic, cultural, who may be over-identified in special ed and in discipline. Um, so we'll be examining those practices to figure out how we can improve that. Uh, at the secondary level, we're also looking to decrease the number of students with significant disabilities who receive the majority of their instruction in self-contained classrooms. Um, in some of our secondary buildings, we still have electives that are um, specific to self-contained programs, so we think that that's a good place to at least start to include those students in some of the electives to a greater extent. And finally, looking at how we can measure student engagement through a school climate survey. Um, and that would look at various student groups, how connected they feel at school, um, and then really developing an action plan from there. Okay, can so I just, our, real quick, yes. um, just as a point of clarification, the mm -hmm. cultural proficiency plan is actually at this month's ECP. October, yes, I'm Correct. sorry. Just yes, for you're right. Mr. Patchell or anybody <laughs> watching at home. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the next yes, ECP meeting. next again. ECP, you're right. Okay, great. Um, so goal three is to improve our district infrastructure and security so that we have a safe, orderly, and up-to-date learning environment. And some of our strategies to do that are the development of a facility usage plan, renovation plan, and long-range planning, uh, continuing our improvements to district and school safety practices, and then utilizing technology to streamline workplace efficiencies. Uh, we will be implementing a new student information system next year, which is 
an exciting thing for us because it's really going to tie all of our systems together. Right now, our databases don't always necessarily talk to each other, so we have a separate database for student information, a separate for special ed, so we're looking forward to having that more integrated and having a more efficient system. Um, we're also looking to establish a plan for a teacher web presence and our reorganization of our intranet resources. As we've shifted more to Google, we're trying to figure out how we can leverage that uh, to get some information out to our teachers more effectively. Okay, so moving along to goal four. Goal four is around implementing operational and organizational efficiencies to improve service to students in the community while still maintaining fiscal responsibility. So our strategies here are improving communication of district finances so that that information is more easily accessible to the board and to the community. The financial reports, as you know, are quite lengthy and dense to get through. Um, so how can we make that more um, user friendly for our community? Also, we are looking at a financing plan for construction and capital improvement co uh, projects. Uh, looking at our various departments to figure out how we can develop and implement organizational efficiencies and cost controls through RFPs for different softwares. Um, also looking at our community ed and engagement program and how we can uh, reduce costs and increase revenue. And then finally improving the operational efficiencies and support services. Okay, so goal five. Um, this is our goal that I was referring to earlier in terms of really centering around student behavior, social emotional learning, and mental health. And what we're looking at is how we can develop a greater continuum of services to support students in those areas. So our strategies are to expand the use of school-wide positive behavior interventions and supports at the elementary level. And we currently have one building that is in year two of school-wide PBIS, and we have three that are going through training now. Uh, the state does not recommend that you do all 13 at once just for capacity, and there really is a need to, to run this with fidelity and make sure that we're all operating under the same um, procedure and constraints. Um, we're also looking how we can use our behavior specialists to provide staff training and consultation for students experiencing those behavioral challenges. Uh, we are providing staff with trauma-informed instruction that will start this year um, so that we have staff that are receiving professional development on student mental health. Um, we're using professional staff from outside agencies and we're also leveraging our own resources such as our behavior specialists, school psychologists, and school counselors. Um, and then finally, implementing a social emotional curriculum at the elementary level and expanding mental health services across all levels. So the implementation of our school climate coordinator positions have definitely helped at elementary and we've started implementing second step curriculum there. Uh, our school climate survey will also be part of that to help us get a pulse on what the climate is and how we can improve. Uh, one of the things we are further looking at is the development of an in-district transitional program for students who might be experiencing behavioral crisis or mental health crisis. A lot of times these students will go into a very restrictive placement such as a hospitalization and they come back to school without that safety net. So we're trying to build in some more supports there. Um, we'll also be piloting the use of a mental health screening tool to help us determine at-risk students. So we're really trying to look at behavior and mental health similarly to how we would look at academics with a universal screener, getting a read at where everyone's at, and then developing our interventions from there. And our last goal was added uh, at the suggestion at the last ECP meeting to really call something out specifically around career exploration and workforce readiness. And it was a great suggestion because there are a lot of things that we were already doing, but we hadn't highlighted it in the plan. Um, so that will, you'll see the inclusion of that here, which we didn't previously discuss at ECP in terms of the overall plan. Um, so we'll be looking at providing students with career exploration and training opportunities that prepare them to be college, career, and work ready. Uh, so some of the things that we're doing around that is our elementary students are participating in guidance lessons around career readiness. And we really look to align these strategies with what's called the Chapter 339 plan. And that's something our guidance counselors are working on now, which is the career readiness and guidance plan. So as I mentioned, we were on the right path to doing these, but hadn't necessarily called that out previously. So our middle school students will be completing a career portfolio. In high school, we have the Naviance platform, which assists with college applications, but there also is a career component that we'll be developing. Um, and then we'll, we're also looking just to improve our communication about our available career and technical education programs. And that are, those are our goals. Any questions? I do have a question on mm -hmm. Sure. Um, 
Sure. I do have a question on goal one. Okay, <laughs> go ahead. You go back to that. The um, uh, talked about now we have the one on one um, uh, Chromebooks, and we need to teach the teachers how to incorporate the learning rather than just make it electronic instead of in mm -hmm. writing. And I, I agree with all that. The question is, I've seen some studies, research statements, um, about screen time and youth. And that they're getting like six hours or whatever a day mm -hmm. and that that's not good. Mm -hmm. So how does this help that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think in terms of the screen time, the intention is never that we have these devices and they're on them all day. You know, it should be to enhance instruction, not replace it. Um, so while we might be using the computer to help deliver some of that or to enrich it or provide extension opportunities, you know, it's not a substitute for the teacher. Um, so the, and I think that our teachers understand that. Um, but that's something that we can definitely be intentional about as we're moving down this road. And, and something we've heard is a concern from our teachers as well and our counselors that, you know, we want to make sure that we're not overdoing it. Um, so we are sensitive to that. I think you want to think about the quality of the screen time sure. as well. I mean, obviously, yeah. you know, a lot of the screen time that they're engaging in on their own is YouTube and gaming. And so, you know, in order to make sure that we're tapping into their an understanding of, of content and literacy that they are coming up with in this you know in this day and time we need to reach them at where they're at right now so to provide them with better content a better way to screen out what is real and fake news you know what is a good way to to have literacy in terms of digital literacy you know it's something that institutions and schools should be engaging more in, in taking ownership of I'm, I'm not I'm not against it I just just recently heard this statement and it's like quality of what they're looking at is good it's mm -hmm. not just more on games or whatever right um but i just wondered how they're incorporating terry you're on the right track thing. there's actually a professor at drexel that's getting national recognition right now because she's linked screen time to autism and it's something a lot of districts are studying and they're finding a correlation when they reduce screen time the autism rates are going down um, so it is definitely something I think we should With certainly. With increased screen time and? Decrease of screen time. They're seeing children that have been diagnosed with autism, they're being undiagnosed because they're seeing it in reverse. Okay. So there is some correlation. It's a big deal at Drexel right now that I know a lot of the IUs, I know Montgomery and um, Lehigh IUs are you know, having big discussions about it with their therapists and their providers. So it's definitely something I think we should certainly keep in mind, but how we're using it and Thank everything. You. Yep. <coughs> Great question. Are there any other questions for Dr. Rufo? You mentioned a lot about, I love the idea of a mental health screening tool, mm -hmm. a standard that could be used across the district, um, and then moving more towards a trauma-informed approach, and certainly the growth of PBIS, expansion of that is helpful. Um, are there plans that are equal to or greater to then train staff? So are there in-service days to, the, to train and prepare them for some of these changes. So trauma-informed is only as effective as everyone buys in or everyone is a part of it or knows their role or understands the concept. Yes, and actually our early dismissal day this Thursday is dedicated to trauma-informed instruction and we've really made an effort to hit all of our staff. So our professional staff, our assistants, um, some of our staff that aren't going to be present on Thursday, um, like transportation, have actually already received trauma-informed instruction. So uh, we really tried to make an effort that we're hitting all groups because students are coming into contact with these people throughout mm -hmm. the day. Um, security staff will be involved, so um, that is something that we've we've started to do. Great. And it goes beyond just the early dismissal. We have a contract with Lakeside, and uh, there's a pretty comprehensive plan, uh, including you know some videos are being made, and then individuals viewing those videos, and then responding to what they've seen, and um, in different times throughout the year. So it's a pretty comprehensive plan. Any other questions? I just want to say for those who've indulged in the full 200 page report, this was an awful lot of work. <laughs> yes. So thank you. It's very thank comprehensive you. and um, 
appreciate all the effort. And, and yeah, absolutely. The team, yeah. <laughs> and to the team that helped out, too. And the team as well, yeah. Several absolutely. dozen members listed there. I think. Definitely a team effort, yeah. yes. Thank you. Yes, so, thank you. <laughs> right. I'm going to keep reading through it, so. <laughs> through all of it yet, It'll but. put you to sleep tonight. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, so is that, no one else has any questions? Okay. Then we just have the audience of citizens. Mr. Patchell, do you want to? Oh, Set the clock you. for another three minutes. Uh, yes, I'll make this very quick. And uh, I'll try to keep it within three minutes. Okay. Firstly, you need to find other income streams besides property taxes. If you want to implement, Im implement these things that you're talking about, you do recognize that inflation is going to come up very quickly and you've been held down with very low interest rate. You've been living in a dream world. And now... You're trying to dream big, but I guarantee you the headwinds that you're going to run into will make Hurricane Michael look almost insignificant. The preparation, you are focused on tests and the preparation for these. You're, but actually, the real conditions are poverty is growing. How will you correct a dysfunctional, dysfunctional family? They, many, many people, they don't live in Upper Gwinnett. They don't live in Lower Gwinnett. They don't live in Montgomery Township. They live in Lansdale and Hatfield. And we all know that a lot of people, wow, their family is really, really terrible. But nobody can, if you don't really live in that environment, you really don't know. And to correct somebody and bring them back, just, just to be average, you're going to have to hire intervention to, to correct all these things that are going wrong. You have large expenditures on buildings and transportation. The high school cost is rising quickly with uh, uh, affirmative uh, uh, mandatory wage in, uh, on, the, on, the, on the building trades. You need bus replacements, pension and medical costs, salary contract, and unknown items. Think of staff quitting. Now, this was hard to believe. Once upon a time, teachers were very low, lowly paid, and it was, it was the last place you'd want to get a job. But things got better. Think of the staff quitting and driving for waste management. After nine years, he's a step six or seven. You know what? I'm going to drive a trash truck. They're starting me at $115,000 plus full benefits. That's how bad it's going to get. Because unemployment is going to go from 3.7, 2.7, 1.7, because every month 300,000 people retire. Do you understand what that means? The labor participation rate is only 61%. You're running out of people. And you know what? The conclusion, I was reading something. How's it going to work? Oh, well, we have a solution. Women, we have immigrants and robots, because that's where we're going. J.B. Hunt. Gee, I can't wait for the Google truck because down on 95, we, we couldn't get any drivers to do that kind of work. Okay? So the 10-year note is now 3.27. This is pretty significant. If we go back to, to Jerome Powell and it gets heated along, what are you going to do when the 10-year Treasury gets to 6, 7, 8? Gee, I hope we don't go back to Paul Volcker because the short-term rate was like 18%. That was during Vietnam, and they fought a war that they really didn't have any money for. None of you were probably even alive at that time, or you were very, very, you weren't even in kindergarten. Ask anybody in the military who's a captain now. How about the retention? Oh, yeah, how much does a captain make? Oh, it probably makes about 65000 Yeah, and Mr. I go Patrick? all over the place. My wife hates it. Mr. Well, Patrick? I got I got a job in United Airlines making a whole lot more money. That's why, that's why the military can't keep anybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Does anyone else have anything else? No? Move to adjourn? Thank you.